Uh, good morning to all of you. My name is George Mens. I'm here from Goldsmiths College at the University of London. Um, I've been uh, asked to speak about the deregulation of labor markets in the European Union, and um, indeed I will uh, be talking uh, about just that, but I will also have a, a few general remarks uh, to make with respect to uh, the prospects of European Union social policy. Um, I will start off by two quotes, and the one is, of course, from Jacques Delors, who famously quipped, you cannot fall in love with a market. And the other one is uh, by Wim Dausenberg, who um, in uh, the early noughties proclaimed that the euro was bringing peace and prosperity to Europe. Um, in many ways, it can be said that both of these gentlemen were entirely wrong, that is to say, it does seem to be possible to fall in love with a market, um, albeit that love is not really one that is particularly widely shared throughout Europe's populace. And similarly, of course, arguably, the euro has brought neither peace nor prosperity to Europe. The um, um, DeLorean vision that um, was just referred to in uh, David's opening remarks of complementing market integration with social protection has largely been abandoned by a focus on competitiveness. And that is, of course, a um, core element which we see throughout the uh, Lisbon agenda and now in the Europe 2020. So in other words, that, that um, earlier emphasis that um, ought to have informed and penetrated the um, Maastricht Treaty has been lost over the course of the past 15 years or so. Um, in that sense, uh, what I will uh, say today is um, fairly pessimistic in terms of its uh, overall tone, but uh, I'm afraid to say it is also fairly realistic in terms of um, the prospects of a social complementing element um, being ultimately relatively limited. And indeed, there is some evidence to suggest that, um, if anything, uh, we're heading into a very different direction. The general framework, the general conditions um, are um, very unpromising looking. Uh, Europe is in a core set of austerity, um, that is to say that effectively the margins for maneuver with respect to, to public spending are of course extremely limited indeed. Uh, if one studies up close the um, uh, new policies that are um, either on the wish list or indeed are on the to-do list of the technocratic governments in Greece and Italy. Uh, one, fe one feels reminded of the um, term that was coined in the early 1980s in this country, which was of course the term of sadomonetarism, that is to say, <laughs> the idea that effectively um, one ought to inflict a certain amount of pain um, for long-term um, albeit quite uncertain gain. The um, lesson that appears to be learned uh, inside the Brussels bubble with regards to trying to fix the euro is one of back to the roots, but not to the roots of the 1970s, but rather to the roots of the Maastricht criteria, um, problematic as though they were in the first instance we find effectively, of course, no real critical revisiting of what is arguably an obsession with the limitation of public debt and thus indirectly public spending. The uh, master criteria, of course, have also been criticized by um, orthodox economists for effectively over-determining certain elements, in particular monetary stability. And uh, by revisiting these criteria uncritically, the uh, final nail is being driven in the coffin of Keynes and the prospects for trying to revive um, substantial public spending are um, very much limited as of course Francois Hollande will be finding out within the very near future. The, um, Rescue attempts that have been made institutionally and politically by the European Union, uh, which of course are all moving into the direction of effectively um, adding an element to the governance of the euro, which wasn't there earlier, which is macroeconomic coordination and increasing control and surveillance of um, public budget design. 
again, all point effectively into the direction of reinforcing and strengthening um, the original elements of what was then rather optimistically called the Stability and Growth Pact. So the Maastricht criteria are effectively dusted off and reinforced and reinvigorated. The trouble is, of course, the fundamental design flaws of the Euro um, are here with us to stay and they're in no way meaningfully addressed. That is to say, um, aside from the um, perhaps slightly academic quibbles about the overdetermination that are an inherent element of the Maastricht convergence criteria, there are also more fundamental problems uh, with respect to the composition and the membership of the Eurozone. There's a fundamental lack of compatibility uh, between the Eurozone members, and that is, of course, in no way, in no way addressed. So, um, in many ways, um, that leaves us with um, a very much less than promising starting position for any attempt to um, design EU-level social policy in uh, the way that Jacques Delors had in mind. In fact, in many ways, um, the prospects for the decade ahead or so look quite troubling. It does seem likely that we're effectively going to face a decade of uh, decline for Southern Europe. Um, Germany, the current engine of growth, um, is effectively basing its growth both obviously on a um, fairly aggressive export-led strategy, which may yet also um, reach its limits, but it, it is of course also doing this um, on the basis of effectively a um, low real wage increase strategy, that is to say, effectively um, a um, strategy of very much limiting the participation of employees in economic growth. Uh, since 1995, there has been no real wage increase in Germany. And indeed, even there, um, um, there is a very noticeable fragmentation of the labor market and the steady growth of an entrenched low-wage sector. So the uh, perhaps somewhat um, stereotypical characterization of Germany as being a highly organized and highly regulated variety of capitalism with a very strongly um, regulated labor market, I think is in many ways quite an anachronistic image, which for some reason uh, perseveres in um, certain academic circles, but really no longer reflects reality. The reality is one of the much more um, stratified labor market with significant uh, wage gaps and differences also in terms of working conditions. So um, with this sort of overall um, macroeconomic framework, the um, potential for um, positive regulation in the uh, Scharfian sense, that is to say re-regulation um, of um, economic processes through the creation of proactive EU social policy design seem extremely limited. Um, but that is, of course, in some sense, uh, an issue area which will be addressed by my colleagues uh, throughout this morning's panel. I will, um, in my own remarks, focus more on, on labor market integration and draw on um, some recent research in doing so. So what is, what is happening to Europe's labor markets and how is European labor market policy uh, changing and how, does it, how is it being affected by effectively what I've called the, the renaissance or the dusting off of the Maastricht um, criteria in almost unaltered um, form and indeed in a reinforced kind of way. Um, well, the um, key claim I'm going to uh, submit is um, one associated with the term of dualism. Uh, so say, I argue that effectively we're witnessing a disintegration of labor markets um, throughout Europe. And um, I'm also going to suggest um, the addition of a new word to the English lexicon, which is that of uh, tierization, that is to say the disintegration into different uh, tiers. 
the, um, again, austerity programs um, that are in the public domain, uh, which are planned in Greece and Italy, uh, promote very actively precisely such strategy as part of an effort to try um, to rein in uh, public spending and render the countries uh, economically more competitive. That is to say, they very actively uh, attempt to promote wage restraint, uh, the restriction of employee rights, and effectively a um, breakup of labor markets into different uh, tiers. This restriction on employee rights, in fact, goes so far as to include uh, limitations on the right to strike in Greece, which is, of course, in contravention to applicable ILO uh, regulations. The um, major hope that was, um, I think, implicit in the creation of the Eurozone was that, effectively, immigration might be able to address some of the asymmetric shocks if such shocks uh, were to arise in the process of um, future economic developments. However, there really isn't much evidence to suggest that uh, immigration thus far has effectively addressed um, the problems that seem to be asymmetrically affecting certain uh, members of the Eurozone. Pan-EU migration is very uh, limited indeed, uh, notwithstanding some uh, anecdotal evidence to suggest that there is um, the beginnings of a um, south-north movement. Um, less than 3% of the total EU population live outside of their uh, country of birth. And that, um, uh, I argue, is in fact unlikely to change because effectively the um, countries that appear to be demonstrating economic growth, uh, which can be characterized as constituting uh, Holland Soskis, coordinated market economies, uh, don't easily accommodate um, immigrants which are trained outside of their own uh, vocational and higher education training systems. So in other words, these CMEs are structurally not particularly well placed to accommodate um, uh, European EU labor migrants. There's no real complementarity there in terms of the skills portfolio that the potential immigrants bring, and consequently, um, there's relatively little appetite um, on the part of Northern European coordinated market economies to open their labor markets to newcomers from um, the South. Now, structurally, the liberal market economies, um, including the United Kingdom and Ireland, would be much better placed to do so because of the fact that um, their own skill strategies rely a lot more on on-the-job training, on company-specific training schemes, there are no established, highly regulated vocational training schemes. And consequently, structurally, they're better positioned and might be in a better position to accommodate uh, intra-EU mobility. However, given the um, position in the business cycle that these two countries find themselves in, it is very unlikely that there's a great deal of appetite amongst uh, the business community to accommodate um, labor migrants. So they would, um, these, two, these countries would effectively struggle to provide newcomers with jobs, even though they would be structurally much better placed to do so compared to the um, coordinated market economies which are roaming ahead economically in relative terms, of course, vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the Eurozone. So structurally, there, there um, is um, very little reason to pin a great deal of hope to um, effectively um, migration taking up some of the slack and perhaps um, not obviously providing a panacea, but providing some sort of solution to the um, asymmetric problems faced in the Eurozone member states. They're real impediments, and it's not easy to see how, uh, if at all, this can change. So 
so um, with regards to the um, uh, labor markets across Europe and indeed across the Eurozone, effectively, um, the argument I'm making is that we are witnessing a disintegration of labor markets into um, several tiers and um, the emergent entrenching of dualism of labor markets. By that I mean not just um, the whole debate that uh, in uh, Francophone Europe is often um, surrounding the term of precarité or precariousness and its growth, the difficulties in transition into the labor market from secondary and tertiary education for young people, especially um, in Southern Europe and um, in that category. Uh, in this particular instance, I would include France. But really what I'm referring to is um, more than that, a true disintegration of um, the labor market into, into uh, very separate tiers and what is arguably a lot more troubling than that, an entrenching of these um, tiers as well. <coughs> in other words, we're witnessing the emergence of prominent low-wage sectors, prominent low-wage sectors that are here to stay. Uh, these are not temporary phenomena anymore. These are not phenomena that uh, will somehow go away or disappear overnight. They're here to stay. That difference um, in terms of working conditions, wages, employee rights is now firmly established. Um, it's very difficult to see also how the conditions and wages in um, the lower tiers are going to improve. Um, I don't just mean that in terms of um, the overall macroeconomic picture being um, suitably bleak, as I argued in my opening remarks, but I also mean that in terms of um, this structural entrenchment effectively showing absolutely no sign of um, decreasing or being modified at all, quite the opposite. Um, trade unions struggle, or in some instances appear to have almost given up and organizing employees in these lower tiers. Um, in certain Southern European countries, there's of course the added difficulty of uh, some of these lower tiers effectively being in the black, that is to say the undocumented sector of the economy. I'm referring to Greece, Italy, and to some extent also to Spain. So there's very little um, hope or prospect for any sort of a modification of the wages and working conditions in these lower tiers. If anything, domestic wage gaps are uh, increasing. I don't just mean that with regards to the uh, debate, which has recently, of course, attracted a lot of press coverage regarding uh, excessive executive pay, but I also mean that with regards to um, wage gaps between these tiers of the labor market, um, outside of the sort of stratosphere that pay reaches um, for CEOs. The latter, of course, is not a purely Anglo-American debate, even in countries, again, where we would perhaps um, expect that a little bit less, um, such as Germany. The um, pay gap between average salaried employees and CEOs has doubled from 1 to 8 in 1977 to 1 to 16 uh, at present. And so, of course, roughly 1 to 56 here in the UK. So this is, this is um, one phenomenon, but the, the one I'm, I'm referring to really has to do with um, effectively uh, labor market stratification um, further down the pecking order. Um, troublingly, if anything, um, the recent uh, activities by the European Court of Justice, if anything, seem to contribute to this stratification. Um, in a variety of court rulings, the European Court of Justice has fairly actively, some might say aggressively, promoted the cause of the single market in terms of um, advocating the rights of companies that promote, um, sorry, that uh, provide services transnationally in Europe. And whilst this is not per se 
necessarily out of step with what the ECJ tends to do. It is in this instance quite troubling because the ECJ arguably is overstepping its mark in terms of intruding upon the rights of member states to regulate their labor markets with regards to statutory minimum wage regulations, for example, with regards to the right to industrial action and so on. So I'm referring to the Laval, uh, Luxembourg, and Rifford cases which, uh, with which uh, some of you may, of course, be very familiar indeed. In all of these rulings, effectively, the ECJ has fairly aggressively struck down uh, limitations on the rights of member states to attempt to re-regulate, uh, or indeed to regulate at all, um, the provision uh, of services by transnational foreign but EU-based companies um, on their territory. This is, of course, significant because in a Europe in which there are wage gaps um, of the magnitude of 1 to uh, 32, uh, pan-European service provision may well contribute to um, the sort of disintegration of the labor market which I have sketched. Now I hasten to add that this is of course not a, not a causal factor, it is a correlated factor, that is to say that pan-European um, service provision is not causing this disintegration, but it is contributing to it. And of course the magnitude alone is such that it couldn't possibly cause this kind of unraveling that I'm so concerned about here. The um, other factor which appears to be contributing to um, this sort of um, disintegration of the labor market is a fairly large scale non-EU immigration that was um, actively promoted starting from the late 1990s. In some European countries, um, large scale immigration was actively solicited, in others it was effectively tolerated. Uh, but wherever one looks, effectively, um, the consensus in the late 1990s to early 2000s um, shifted away from the policy goal of emigration zero, of zero legal immigration, to a new consensus on the desirability of immigration to effectively um, fill in labor market gaps drive forward economic competitiveness, promote economic growth, and create effectively a win-win upward economic spiral. Uh, the trouble is that some of this immigration seems to have fed into uh, the lower tiers of the labor market. And of course, European uh, governments are effectively relearning the lessons of the 1970s, that is to say immigrants are human beings they're not just economic agents, and they don't simply return even as um, the subcontinent is entering its worst economic crisis since the 1930s. There's rel relatively little evidence to suggest that there's effectively large-scale return immigration of these newcomers. Mm. Again, this is a process of correlation, not causation. That is to say, um, immigration is not driving this bifurcation. But it is certainly um, one important factor worth mentioning uh, with regards to having uh, contributory effects. So um, we see an entrenched disintegration of um, the European labor market and markets. Effectively, um, this process is not only showing no signs of slowing down, if anything, it seems to be increasing. The um, framing structural conditions are such that there's relatively little hope with regards to any fundamental change. There seems to be relatively uh, little impetus coming from the European Commission with regards to fundamentally changing these preconditions, quite to the contrary. And there's also, as I mentioned, an element of effectively um, contributing to these developments in uh, the case of the ECJ court rulings that I've alluded to. 
So I'm concluding overall on a perhaps slightly pessimistic note, that is to say, I'm uh, making the argument that effectively uh, we're witnessing this new tier structure. These tiers um, are entrenched, they're not changing, and the little EU activity that there seems to be with regards to addressing these sort of elements seems to be uh, effectively reinforcing them. And I'll leave you at that. I'm also out of time, I believe. Hey, thanks very much, George. Good morning. Well, I found this quite depressing, <laughs> this first speak, speech. Uh, I think it's, it would be, for me, it would be a good start to have a debate about this. Uh, but I was asked to give a different presentation, so uh, I'm going to give my presentation, but I hope that during the time of discussion we can come back to some of, the, some of it, um, some of the first presentation. I have been asked to focus specifically not on, on labor and, and employment per se, but on the, um, on the social aspects in general. And for the moment, I have chosen to specifically talk about what we are doing for the moment in the context of 2020, because that is uh, actually happening as we speak. Um, and um, it is, uh, I, I would say, I'm less pessimistic uh, than the first speaker, but I have two messages in a way, is that Yes, we are in, uh, we collectively in Europe, but also in the world, we are in a transformation phase. And we have an opportunity here to move forward in a different way. We need to, but we should not forget that social and the social welfare uh, states or the social models, as there are several models in Europe, have, um, should be our pride, I, I think, I have worked internationally for years and uh, I can tell you that most of the people around in other countries are looking to Europe on maybe not for the moment uh, exactly today, but uh, the, the, the, the social welfare models we have uh, have uh, really attracted a lot of attention and I think no region in the world has reached the welfare of the population as it has today. And I think we should be proud about this and we should build further. And I hope here, and that's why I'm coming here, because to me, Scotland is, and this university has always been very much at the foreground of uh, developing also new thinking in social areas. And that's what we need for the moment. Uh, I, as I said, my staff is in the middle of discussions and finalization for the moment of the uh, 2020 recommendations uh, adopted yesterday uh, and now discussed with the member states further. But I really did an effort to come here because I hope that uh, we can, I can have one message further here is that this is, social Europe is in your hands. Social Europe is in the hands of the young people and we need to, uh, together, do, make uh, a difference for the future. We, the Social Europe will have to transform in a reality that is today's reality. Today's reality of a crisis is not something that is purely created by Europe and truly not created by Brussels. Maybe some of the decisions in Brussels can be discussed, but let's not forget that Brussels is not just the Commission, that all of the decisions are taken collectively with the member states. And this member state has played a very important role, one way or another, on positions in social Europe and the competences given in uh, Brussels about social Europe. And that's what we're trying to wiggle around this sometimes. Okay? I'm not going to bore you with competences that you can find in, and I think I saw somebody who knows the whole history and brings the whole history later on, so uh, that will be quite interesting. So I'm, very, I'm going to give a presentation that is very pragmatic, but I hope that uh, on, on where we are for the moment in the social dimension of Europe 2020 and social investment for growth. I start with something that is quite gloomy in a way, 
uh, because that is reality for the moment. Um, the reality for the moment is, of course, that people um, really suffer from the crisis in general, and people is why we are here. Not, um, the economic recovery seems to be at a standstill for, two, for 2012. There is little hope uh, for the future that it will improve. Unemployment is high, unacceptably high, and in some countries, um, really um, impossibly high among young people, specifically. Uh, a lot of people in around Europe, when you ask them during the Eurobarometer 8 of 10, think that uh, poverty will increase in the coming um, years. The one target that we have asked all of the member states to look at and what we are following also with the silk uh, uh, way is, is the at risk of poverty or exclusion. And you see here that Ireland is, of course, moving very much upwards. That some other countries, UK is, it's here I think, because the colors are not very good on the, on the screen for the moment. So UK is basically, um, the poverty, at risk of poverty is increasing a little bit. Let's not forget that these are data from 2010 and that the recent impact of the uh, crisis cannot be measured through this. And we are uh, busy working on developing that method so that we have more up-to-date data in some member states are already uh, working with, your, with, with us and with Eurostat to, um, to develop this uh, uh, newer uh, data set. Now, we have, um, we, I'm talking Europe, and talking Europe is all of the member states together with the Commission, okay, have accepted this year um, to look at the annual growth strategy which is the annual way of working towards reaching our uh, goals that we set for Europe 2020, collectively. This is a collective work, okay? This year, in 2012, we have done a little bit of a step forward in the direction of more social. It is not, not um, revolutionary on the social aspect, but at least there is one step forward in the way that we have asked now member states to look specifically also at the tackling the social consequences of the crisis, improving the effectiveness of their social protection systems and implementing the active inclusion policies. The active inclusion policies encompass labor market activation measures, quality so social services and adequate income support. This, to say the I mean, I'm not sure in how far you know the way we work in these areas, but the AGS, the annual growth survey, uh, the, the annual growth strategy um, and semester sets the pace for what we will look at, what the Commission will look at in the national reports from the member states. And that's what we have finalized yesterday, actually. So we look. We have a mandate to look at these areas, and we look at these areas on how the member states are doing. We spent quite a lot of time in analyzing this. Also, uh, in the next few days, we will start looking at this with the member states. The member states themselves have in, in, uh, sent us uh, documents on national reform programs, annual reform programs. UK has done so, and Scotland has um, has a peculiarity that they have also included a Scottish national re research pr uh, uh, program, which is quite interesting as an approach, because some of the uh, competences are, of course, a bit the same like in Europe, not fully developed in Scotland. Uh, so how do you uh, develop your program is, of course, also, but it's quite an interesting approach that has been followed here. Um, and I wanted to recognize this. Just one slide, uh, because we could go in a lot of extensive discussions on all of this, and, and you will find a lot of literature on all of this, of course. But of course, when we look at social protection expenditure from the member states, it is clear from this, as far as this is clear, <laughs> 
the, well, what should be clear here is that the, for a similar expenditure here on social protection, your outcomes of, on inequality are quite different. If I remember well, UK is somewhere here. Hungary is actually more effective with the same money uh, than, uh, for example, Spain here. Okay? And that's what we are specifically looking at because one thing that can be done at least is improve the efficiency of the resources that are there. And so that's some of the member states will have a recommendation of increasing their uh, social expenditure and that's what it is part of it what is based on. So I said already the process that we are following on the uh, European semester results and the national reform programs. The national reform, one, one of the main, one of the main um, findings that we have for the moment also is that the national reform programs are in general lacking very much a comprehensive strategy for poverty. Some of you will recall that the poverty target was actually not accepted by some of the member states, including the UK. So, uh, and some member states have followed different kind of ways of measuring the target, so it is a bit difficult uh, to compare, which is, uh, doesn't make our task easier, but at least we don't, what we can see is that there is not really a comprehensive strategy uh, in some of the member states mm -hmm. to tackle poverty, which we all agreed together uh, to try to do. Yesterday, um, the Commission uh, finalized the uh, assessment of the national reform programs and came up with uh, country recommendations. These country recommendations were uh, finalized while I was uh, traveling here. The national, maybe one po more point, the national reform programs from, uh, received from the countries, we also add, the countries are adding a social report on this also, because the national reform programs uh, don't have a lot of space to, to, to talk about the social aspects specifically, and so there is, the countries are also making a national social report, and in that social report, if some of you are interested, there is much more uh, argumentations, rationale, and uh, results that you can find um, in there. Now, the specific recommendations, um, I didn't, uh, as, as this was finalized while, we, while I was traveling to come here, I didn't finalize the, or my staff didn't finalize the, um, but for the moment in 2011, we had a few poverty recommendations, for example, in these three countries. But in 2012, we have um, 16 recommendations on pensions. Pensions is the main area of where reform is needed in uh, a lot of the countries from the perspective of sustainability but also from the perspective of adequacy. And there, there is also a gender dimension that we'd like to highlight uh, as most of the poor older uh, people are single women and there are more single women in older age than men. Uh, so there is, I'm not going to open up the whole debate on, on, on pensions, but it is an important aspect. So there are several, um, six, 16 member states receive a recommendation on pensions, three specifically on poverty. Uh, one in, uh, one has, uh, UK has a mention on specifically looking at child poverty so that the welfare reforms that are being made for the moment uh, are not uh, should be looked at as not having an impact on uh, negative impact on child poverty, which is child poverty is something that is in our uh, unacceptable, but in in general terms, but it is also a bad investment for the future. Of course, that each year lost in child poverty and education uh, means a person that is probably going to not be at its full capacities in society and its workforce, in our workforce in the future. 
And let's not forget that demograph demography shows very clearly that we are for the moment at the level of um, increased old age and increased economic dependency uh, that will not change in the future. There comes, of course, a debate on migration internally and externally that would op open up a ho another presentation. But let's not forget that. We have, because in, in addition to the annual um, semester work, we have specifically, uh, the Commission here has launched with some of the unspent European uh, social fund monies, launched a specific initiative because of the urgency on youth, uh, uh, op uh, youth unemployment. And so there's a youth opportunities initiative where we are really uh, fast tracking some of the support and monies uh, in the, first of all, in the seven countries with the highest level of youth unemployment to try to uh, make sure that young people are or in employment or in training or in skills development. Um, and I think that uh, we, we will have some first uh, results quite soon on this. One of the proposals that is also on the table in discussion with the Member States is that 20% of the European Social Fund for, that is under the discussion for 2014 to 2020 uh, should be used to promote uh, social inclusion and combating poverty. That is not accepted for the moment by some Member States, uh, but this is of course an opportunity to uh, also put some monies on the table for, uh, for social Europe there where it's needed most. Then the last slide I would like to share with you um, a little bit of the thinking for the moment. We are in the middle, I, th I think we are in, or we think in the Commission that we are for the moment in the middle, in the middle of the road of or not, uh, um, not developing social Europe per se and then your title will end up without question mark. <laughs> Uh, I hope that question mark will be answered positively and it will, there will be a transformation. The transformation can only be possible if we all work together towards a new vision on where we want to get with social Europe. I don't think our populations can accept that social Europe is going to be deconstructed, but we have to be realistic uh, with uh, the financial resources that are available in in the countries for the moment. On the public sector, we need to harness more, um, more, more inputs also from private sector and more collective responsibility, I believe. But um, we also need to increase the efficiency gains. Uh, we will have to, we are trying to develop a, a more investment approach in social, uh, social Europe in the way that um, for the moment, in the annual strategies, we're looking specifically at the impact of the crisis on social Europe. We would like to change that paradigm a little bit in the direction of investing in social, uh, in, in, in your human capital and in social Europe is a positive element. It is positive not only for people, well-being, but it is also positive for the economy and for competitiveness. And therefore, we are working with some universities on developing a little bit more the arguments and the rationale for not only longer term investments in social Europe. I think there is there, there's quite a lot of information uh, on the returns of investment in investing in education, for example. But we would also like to have a little bit more uh, rationale um, and data about the returns of investment at a shorter term because we, we cannot afford to wait 20 years for the moment. So that is something that we are working with several universities on to try to develop further the thinking and the acceptance uh, around Europe that investing in social areas is important for the economy and should be better included further in the annual strategy to reach our targets uh, our collective targets for 2020. Our collective target of 2020 is um, specifically the strategy is inclusive, sustainable and smart uh, strategy for growth and cohesion. 
in a way. And uh, we are, for the moment, not reaching the targets or even not the ambition of the targets for the moment. The poverty target was supposed to, uh, we were supposed to collectively to decrease um, the, the poverty, uh, at risk of poverty and poverty in poverty with 20 million by 2020. And for the moment when you aggregate the, uh, the ambition of the member states, we barely reach 12 million by 2020. So there is some major change that will have to happen. We will have to look at more comprehensive strategies of poverty reduction and part of it will have to go through better investments in social areas uh, and more efficiency gains. I want to leave it at this, but I hope that I changed a little bit uh, the, from the first uh, presentation to uh, moving, let's move forward and let's not forget that our governments, our collective governments, all have a responsibility. For the moment we are in the middle of the 2020 uh, discussion. Next week the member states in the, uh, in the um, committees for financing, for employment and for social affairs come together to discuss the recommendations and the solutions. They make the recommendations to the council. In the council we have all of uh, our leaders taking decisions, accepting or not accepting these recommendations and telling the commission how to go further also. And I think we should, we should be aware that this is, this is the way that the Europe, collective Europe is moving forward or not moving forward. And that's where we all have a collective responsibility to uh, make the changes that we think should be made for the future. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for the nice words. And I'm delighted to be here with such a distinguished audience. Um, I, this morning, I'll, I'll, I want to talk about the impact of the EU, uh, but now um, focusing on the domestic story. So we, so far, we've been talking about the EU story. Now, now let's, let's see what the domestic side of the story is like in terms of employment uh, policies in particular. Um, let me go over my presentation very quickly. I would like to share with you first my research questions, then um, followed up by um, very briefly uh, on different modes of the EU employment policy making. Um, later on, we'll look at the case of OMC, um, that is mode three, as I shall be talking about Europeanization through the EES, um, and, and where I be, I'll be focusing on the accession states Session countries. Uh, fourthly, I'll, I'll talk about the Europeanization of domestic employment policies and identify a research question, uh, a research intuition, which should be followed by, which shall be followed by um, problems of this particular body of research. And finally, I'll talk about policy change. Again, um, we'll peek into the domestic story, how, how things unfold at the domestic level. Um, and, and, and then I shall conclude. I hope to make it in 20 minutes. I have lots and lots of on my plate. Uh, thank you. Thank you. You're very kind. And uh, let's start. OK, uh, the research question or questions are, um, how do we account for change? Um, and not only change, but also continuity in employment policies in pre-accession states. Um, does, the, does the EU play any role in these processes? And if it does, or to the extent that it does, through which mechanisms and under what conditions? Um, so under what conditions change and or continuity happens? This was the, the major question that you know, a group of us have been inspired um, in, in analyzing EU, uh, in analyzing domestic stories of policy change governance change in the case of Turkey. And this was funded by um, TÜBİTAK, Turkish Research, uh, uh, National Research Council, uh, where we look at um, change uh, policy-wise and governance-wise in four different areas, 
uh, including employment policy, economic and monetary policies, that's second. Thirdly, immigration, asylum and border control, Simon is, is working on that. And finally, on regional policy. So, so this is, I, I shall be uh, sharing with you some, only a minute part of my, our, our preliminary findings which, uh, of this ongoing research. Um, case study on Turkey, post-1999, uh, when Turkey was granted candidacy status officially, um, and the case of employment policy in Turkey. Um, employment policy in Turkey is, is highly problematic uh, in many respects, highly important, highly crucial in many respects, one of them being that we now are going through a process where uh, the first national strategy for employment is being, is being drafted. And we did um, look at um, we, did, we did do a content analysis, or we're, we're actually doing a content analysis of legislative acts, uh, parliamentary minutes, uh, reporting in the print media. And uh, I personally con conducted 22 interviews um, with key policymakers uh, and social partners. Um, and in this work, in this um, research, we're, we're using, relying on case study methods, process tracing techniques. Uh, and some participant observation as I do some, um, some work with the Turkish PES, um, Public Employment Service, ISHKU. Um, what follows basically are um, our or my preliminary uh, findings. Modes of employment policy making in the EU. Uh, I am assuming that, that most of us are familiar with, with different po uh, modes of policy making in the EU. Uh, the community method, which takes the form of uh, legisla legislated rights um, implemented via directives um, and, and uh, there is room for variation in member states but, but this, because these are binding there, there won't be uh, room for, for variation in, in, um, in the member states. Uh, more recent forms is um, law via collective agreement. This is Martin Rhodes's term, which aims to promote active participation of social partners at EU and domestic levels. Um, and most recently, after Amsterdam, we see the emergence of new modes of policy making, the OMC, which, which Philippe will be talking about in way much detail than, than I shall, um, which, which brought about um, openings um, through intergovernmental peer learning, uh, persuasion, benchmarking, uh, peer pressure, naming and shaming, and as such. So, so these are typical examples of soft law. Um, and, and this is the, the last mode uh, which I would like to uh, focus on, uh, Europeanization through uh, OMC, through the EES. Um, let, what does the EU model or EU framework looks like? What are the defining features of the EES at the EU level? Um, I'm, I want to rely on Paolo Graziano's work on um, the, the policy structure approach where he looks at principles, procedures, objectives, and instruments of a given policy um, framework. And, um, and I want to start with the principles first um, of the EES representing flex security. Uh, flex security, by the way, in official documents is referred to as the EU's approach to labor markets. So, so uh, flex security is the heart of uh, what uh, EES is constituted of and which is in line with the social investment approach that, that Madame Franson uh, talked about um, before, before the, the fire drill. Um, so principles in terms of flex security, um, it's, it's composed of four principles, four components, that is um, flexibility in labor law, effective active labor market policy supporting mobility between jobs and transition from inactivity unemployment to employment, coherent lifelong learning systems securing employability, and modernized social security systems providing adequate, but also, which is extremely important here, sustainable um, income support, sustainable um, in terms of uh, finance, this financial sustainable income support. The ob objective of ES, or one of the key objective of, objectives of ES is activation. Uh, once again, Madam, Madam Franson talked about um, 
um, annual growth strategy uh, uh, 2012, uh, which is in line with the Lisbon uh, strategy and Europe 22, 2020 targets. Therefore, rather than fighting unemployment, the emphasis is here on uh, enhancing employment and increasing uh, labor force participation across the board. Um, the procedures, thirdly, are through the OMC, uh, once again, as, as um, Philippe will be talking about, in member states. And this takes the form of a joint, the drafting of a, excuse me, joint assessment paper um, in pre-accession countries, where the commission and each government uh, drafts an assessment of what's out there. And we've got two instruments, financial instruments, two types of instruments, and in the case of member states, this is the ESF, European Social Fund, financing projects in member states, and for pre-accession countries, we've got uh, uh, IPA, IPA, uh, instrument for pre-accession, which provides funds, um, financial, uh, financial flows, to pre-accession countries supporting uh, uh, human uh, development uh, operational programs. And um, in parallel, a second type of instrument concerns the policy-making instrument, and um, EES emphasizes modernization of the PES. Uh, we just, it was, we came here last, uh, yesterday, uh, late afternoon, and around the corner of the hotel there was a job center plus office, and, and these are the modern, modernized PES. Uh, and in Turkey we've got Ishku as its um, counterpart. Um, which is being, being uh, modernized, renovated, uh, revamped. Um, what does the literature say? What is the state of the art in the literature, in the Europeanization literature, focusing on domestic employment policies? Uh, the question revolves around um, what is the impact of ES on domestic employment policy change? And we've got somewhat contradictory findings, results. Um, and that we've got no consensus in the literature. Um, some studies find some significant impact on domestic labor market policies. Uh, Bart van Herke from the Observatoire Social European that, that Philippe established uh, and other colleagues have found some significant change. Others, um, such as Jacobson and West, find um, limited impact due to weak adaptation pressures and the non-binding status of soft law. Um, Still others find no impact at all. Again, our colleague from the Observatoire Social European, uh, Caroline de Laporte, uh, finds um, no impact. And finally, a small group of studies um, or, or scholars argue that the impact is conditional upon uh, domestic factors such as political parties and level of support for the EU in general. <coughs> and this is by Paolo Graziano and, and other colleagues. So, so these look for the impact of the ES um, through a top-down research um, design where the point of departure is, you know, ES seems to be, or ES ta is taken as the persona causa, the actor which does the effect, which produces the effect, the, the main culprit in the story. Um, there are other studies um, which turn the question on its head and start by looking at the picture, domestic side of the story, and then uh, questioning what really happened and why those, those things happened, um, what, what transpired in, in between um, these, these changes, um, relying on a bottom-up research strategy. Um, ES, for, for, for some scholars, you know, some scholars report that the ES strengthens the hands of reformers, opens up um, windows of, of opportunity, but in general, the ES, through the processes of, of OMC, reproduces um, national patterns due to institutional lock-ins and path dependencies. And a second group of scholars, including my supervisor, which I later find, found out, I mean, I didn't know that he was working on this, Axel Vandenberg from McGill, um, he has been working on the adoption of flex security, uh, which would depend on especially unions, incentives, and disincentives. In, in countries where we, we've got Ghent system or, or quasi-Ghent systems, uh, we've got um, the, the policy transfer which, which becomes successful. Otherwise, we've got no impact uh, stemming from 
the flex security approach of the EES. Um, now I'd like to talk about the problems of this state of the art, or in this state of the art. The general tendency with the literature here is that we've got a causal impact being assumed by most of the scholars, uh, where we've got limited focus on, on domestic interests and institutions especially. Um, and and um, also we've got, you know, most studies, almost all of them, um, talking about um, member states. So we don't have, we have only one um, grey literature, uh, which, which is on uh, Slovenia, um, talking about you know, when, when Slovenia was in the process of, of accession, um, so focusing on, on the accession process. So, so we've got a gap there too. And um, almost all proponents or, or, or, um, or scholars in the literature take flex security as one single thing, really, um, one single beast uh, in order to, to, to understand the nature of it. Uh, we uh, need to look at different components because it's, it's a hodgepodge of anything and everything. It's a, it's a wish list, it's a desiderata uh, by the European Commission uh, focusing on not only labor law but also social security systems, modernization, sustainability of um, social security systems, active uh, labor market policies, and finally, lifelong learning uh, programs and systems. So, so we need to unpack what's happening in four components, and that was one of the points of departure in, in this research. Um, what, I mean, based on the literature, what would we expect? What would our intuition be for a case like Turkey? Um, the, the, the unrefined intuition would be that we would have very weak adaptation, if at all, uh, due to two main reasons. Um, because of the weak adaptation pressure stemming from the EU, so that's, that's one. Um, because in Turkey, for the case of Turkey, we've got inadequate credibility of EU membership, especially, well, things may be changing, as we've, we've been discussing after Monsieur Hollande coming to power, but, but again, well, um, you know, it's, it's, it was, it made all the headlines in Turkey after Hollande came to power, uh, when, when Sarkozy left. So, so, so again, probably whether, whether that, that's going to change is, is again open to question, uh, but also from the non-binding character of soft law character of the ES, bearing no impact, especially in a country uh, of accession. And secondly, that we've got a misfit, a case of misfit, uh, so large that um, the misfit in terms of the, the EES targets uh, were running um, above, you know, high, uh, unemployment rates uh, around, uh, wavering around 10 to 14 percent, um, but labor force participation rates around less than 50%, which is massively lower than, than the ES targets. And we've got a huge uh, segmentation in terms of gender, 24% um, um, for, for females and around a bit more than 60% for, for males, plus a huge informal sector, which again represents another cleavage in terms of, um, of uh, segmentation. So, so what would the, the, the literature expect? Uh, well. Based on the literature, we would expect no change. So yes, it's unlikely to, to uh, change anything. But what happened? Let's look at the ground. What, what really happened throughout the 20, uh, 2000s? Um, first, out of the four components of the ES, let's look at flexibility in labor law. A uh, new uh, legislation came into effect in 2003, which brought about flexible modes of employment, flex time, um, but applies only to about half of the labor force because of the segmentation. You know, part of the labor, or about half of the lab labor force is in the informal sector. So this covers, this new law naturally would cover uh, those labor market participants under the formal sector. So, so again, highly problematic, but we've got elements of flexibility uh, enhanced in line with the requirements of the ES. So we've got notable change in the direction of EES. Um, second, ALMPs. Um, Turkey had almost absolutely no 
ALMPs. But now things are changing from 2003 onwards. Uh, the Turkish PES ISHKU had been revamped, and there have been three successive pro uh, uh, projects um, followed, following each other, um, which led to uh, supporting ALMPs, and the coverage has been expanding in terms of uh, ALMP policies, given some limited, still limited financial resources. Thirdly, uh, lifelong learning systems. We've got a new policy um, being, a new strategy being adopted in 2009, but this strategy really lacks resources and effective means. So, so for ALMPs and lifelong learning systems, we've got very weak, or rather quite weak, um, change on the ground. Finally, on modernized social security systems, um, new legislation came, came into force to, in 2006, which aimed at enhancing sustainability, but this modernizing element um, is not necessarily being carried out, although there has been some integration, systematization, and rationalization of multiple um, um, schemes um, coming under one single roof. But still, we've got a very narrow and very, very patchy coverage. So, so in the fourth component, we've got some change, but not necessarily in the direction of the flex security approach as adopted by the EES. And this is due to uh, some, some resistance from especially unions, trade unions, and, and uh, the people uh, taking up to the streets. Um, greater change, but, but what happened once again? You know, the literature would expect no change, but, but yes, there has been some change. This is greater than expected, set against the literature. Uh, what's on the ground once again? Um, let me summarize this very quickly and then uh, I'll conclude. Um, flexibility in contracts, some significant change, which is in the direction of the EES. Big business and government supported flexibility throughout. It was very clear. So when you talk to anyone on this, and I, I, did, um, once, um, I did 22 interviews with, with policymakers and uh, key stakeholders in the process, and they all said, Flex security is very important, and flex security is taking place now. But what they understood as flex security was basically flexibility. So um, social partners, well, on the, on the labor side, they were lamenting the process. They hated the idea of flex security because they believed that this was nothing but flexibility. Um, employers and, um, and the government loved the, the, the, the, the entire ball game because they, this, this was, and, and mind you, Turkey, the Turkish government is a huge employer still uh, in the labor market, um, that, that this is going to bring about uh, more flexibility into the system. So, um, so and, and in terms of the institutional lock-ins, we've got weak uh, institutional lock-ins, institutional um, path dependencies. Um, but, but the government has, has successfully used the EU uh, as a leverage, as a trump card. Look, we've, we've got to do it because, because Brussels wants us to do it. Um, so, so, so there's been some, some, uh, some significant change in this component. For the second and third ALMP and LLL lifelong learning components, we've got very modest change. Um, no significant support from big business, and uh, n neither is the case for government. And we've got some transnational learning, some rationality mechanisms at work because money is coming in to revamp ISHKU, uh, the, the modernization of the PES. Um, but, but we've got some modest change. In terms of social security, this is interesting despite all um, calls to sustainability uh, in an age of um, austerity, we've got limited uh, change because well, although big business and the government wanted reforming of the social security reform, read retrenchment reform meaning, um, making everything sustainable, um, there, there was massive reactions to it and um, there was a remarkable institutional uh, inertia, including, for example, grandfathering clauses, meaning that, that unless you are coming into the labor force very recently, you won't be covered under this, this particular reform. So. Um, so the reform attempts, the initiatives, were, uh, were not necessarily shelved, but they were, in a way, undermined by the, by the institutional lock-in systems. 
okay, what do we make all this? And here I'm concluding, David. Um, the Europeanization literature would invariably expect low, if at all some, change in the direction uh, of EES. But when we look at the domestic story, it unfolds that we've got some change. But this is not necessarily due to EES, or is it? So, so this is what, what we are trying to problematize in this, in this particular uh, project. Um, under what conditions change happens? Well, I tried to sort out some of these for you. Um, if the policy area is of no interest to big business and government, such as in the case of ALMP and LLL, because they won't be expecting anything negative out of it, there, there can be modest change, but the government will not be advocating it. They, they won't be um, pushing for it. So, um, and, and change can happen in the direction of ES. If, on the other hand, the policy component, as in the case of um, social, uh, I'm sorry, labor law, uh, flexibili flexibilization of labor law, is of interest, which, which we know that it is, to, to the uh, domestic interest, powerful domestic interest, employers and, and the government, then there can be significant change through using the EU as a trump card, the ES as, as, a, as a trump card, as a leverage to, to flexibilize um, labor contracts, which would be in accordance with the preferences of the interests. If, however, uh, and, and of course there's a proviso here, if there is no institutional lock-in, if there's no institutional uh, counterweight against, counter um, force against this. But there will be very limited change, even if the government wants it, even if the uh, domestic institutions, I'm sorry, domestic interests um, ask for it. But if we've got institutional lock-ins and path dependencies, then this change will not happen. So the, the lesson I'm drawing here finally, is that in accounting for change, policy and governance-wise, we need to be very careful in problematizing not only the transformative, the potential transformative causal impact of the ES only, but we also need to look at um, not only interests, dominant interests, but also institutions. And that's where I will end. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay, David, thank you for inviting me. Uh, the first thing I, I did, I, I changed your awful title because it's not sexy at all that the EU contribution to the collective bargaining and building the social partners. And I changed the title to something I think more appealing, the revenge of central bankers. That's, <laughs> that's the beginning of the story. Uh, <laughs> Before going for, for that, uh, and I will draw a, a lot from the, uh, the PhD of Amy and the stuff I, I wrote 15 years ago, I, I, I will, would like to return to one sentence uh, Liv said to us about Europe. And she spoke about smart growth. And I think that's really the problem. Because who is in favor of stupid growth? <laughs> Nobody. If we are all in favor of smart growth, smart growth means nothing. It's just a way to escape to the debate. It's the same, you put better regulation. Sorry, it's no longer better regulation, it's smart regulation. So all, every time that you have a problem at European level, instead of trying to find the different solution, different option, you had smart. And you think, I solved the problem, all is smart. And that's why I'm rather optimistic even what I will present is rather gloomy, because we have to return to the story of EU as a struggle, as fight between different countries, different ideas, different groups, and not just a, a nice story if we have a kind of bureaucratic uh, story uh, tell, told by the Commission, uh, which think that's the, the, the main problem. And with that, we have to recognize that for the moment, we have different narratives. There is no one narrative. Never in the history you have one narrative. Always you have different narratives. And I will not address that question, but I think we are, we are even more than in kind of fight or struggle between uh, different narratives. We, we are in period of 
paradigm shift in the Kenyan sense. And the paradigm shift is about greening the economy or the, all the post-growth debate. I think that that's really where we are if we, we are looking for the, the next uh, two decades. Uh, and that's really important. And that's normal when you change from one paradigm to another paradigm. It takes time. You have different possibilities. And uh, that's, uh, that's much more structural that's anecdotal that sometimes you have with the stories and the uh, narratives uh, uh, approach. So my main concern was to understand what is happening in Brussels, because it's so strange for the moment. And to see if the crisis is really the reason of radical change in industrial relations, social dialogue, and I will return to that, uh, welfare state and partly uh, wage uh, bargaining. And when I say uh, structural change, no, I have to find my first slide. Okay. It's, it's not English, it's in French, but you have the paper is in English, French, German. And two colleagues are, are, of mine, uh, did, uh, Stefan Kloart and Isabel Schumann, did an exercise of mapping the reform in labor law, the last two years. Not the last five years, the last 10 years, the last two years. And then the first column is the, the most important, is the structural reform of social dialogue at national level. Okay? That's structural reform. And you have 19 countries the last two years on 27 w which had structural reform in industrial relation and social dialogue. In the same period when at EU level all were saying, oh, social dialogue, oh, important, it is structural. And that's also important when you look to the space, because we have the story in Europe that's a Greek Greece, a Greek crisis. But you, you had Latvia before, you have Romania, you have Hungary, you have a lot of, of new member states which are not at all in the picture. When we are speaking about crisis in Europe, or well, social crisis is Spain, Portugal, partly Ireland, Greece. What about all the new member states, which for most of them, with the exception of Poland, are in, uh, in uh, deep uh, trouble? So when we speak, when we speak about uh, the change, uh, it's really uh, important change. So the question uh, is for me, what is the relationship between the changes we have at national level and the crisis? And if I look to the three main domains, welfare state and mainly pension reform, social dialogue and wage. There is little relationship between the reforms and the crisis. And I, I say by crisis, the crisis of public finance. I don't speak about the financial crisis. There is no ring at all for that. But take the pension. What were the main reform in the pension is the age of retirement. What is the link between raising the age of retirement in two, five, seven, ten years, and to solve the crisis of public finance? No, there is no link. And even if you look to the literature about welfare state and pension reform, if you change the rules in the short term, it could be costly, because people will work more and have a higher pension. So where is the, the, the link? No link. It's not that you, we don't need to have a debate about pension, that's clear, but the radical change of the pension had nothing to do with the crisis of public finance. And once again, it's a radical change because the discourse before on welfare state is that we have to increase the real retirement age. So most of the country, the real retirement age was 60, 62. And the legal one was 65. So the idea was to increase uh, until 65. No, it's completely different. It's completely different because it will increase the legal uh, retirement age, but it's also included in the forecast of the member state. I was really surprised. I received some documents from the commission which are non-official. But the Polish, for example, have already decided that the retirement age, the legal one, in 2015 will be 71. We hope that men will drink less alcohol because so far they, they died on average at 66. 
So we return to the past about that, but that's the basic assumption. It's not you have always with, with the forecast the basic and then the, the, the, the changes or, or the, the, the variation. That's the basic. The same for, uh, for Italy. In official document, in six months, the basic assumption is that, a little bit less in Italy, that in 2040, that will be 69. So that changed radically the way of we were thinking about pension reform. When we turn now uh, to uh, the, the question of uh, industrialization, employment policy, I don't have the slide, but uh, you can have it on the website of the Institute. What is rather interesting uh, for the moment is that if you look at the unemployment rate, which is, I think, a better indicator than the unemployment uh, rate. The unemployment rate, what are the countries which are the best for moment? Austria, Luxembourg, Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, Cyprus, Finland now. Rather interesting, all countries Bismarck, that all the scholars are saying, or around Europe, Bismarck and countries are in deep, deep trouble. They cannot be the countries with the institution for the future. But if you take just that indicator, it seems that at least we should have a, a, an academic and a political debate around that. But all the countries have strong institution, strong welfare state, strong social partners. What are the solutions that ECFIN and others are saying? We have to destroy the institution, reduce the ways of the social partners, reduce social dialogue. So once again, that's rather interesting that if you look to the, what are the, the figures and uh, you look about the policies, reco policy recommendation is uh, completely different and I can continue on uh, that with wage, but I don't have uh, time enough. So, what <coughs> I think is the real debate for the moment is the debate around EMU and a group of actors, but not only a group of actors, I will return uh, to that, finding a window of opportunity to push their view of the reform, which have nothing to do with the crisis. It's just a window of opportunity. You push your interest. You, they have learned, as they have learned from the books, all difficulties it is to have reform. And they saw the, the, the window of opportunity pushing uh, their, uh, uh, their, their, their, their reform. And to explain, better explain that, I think we have to take uh, two items into consideration. The first is the idea of EMU. And I will return to that. So what are the ideas linked to social policy when we decide to have the EMU? And that's the mainstream, but much more than the mainstream, and the, the PhD of Amy and uh, other articles explain that very well. The second thing is the interest of the member state and Germany as a hegemon, a model, and a model uh, based on rules and not institutions. And finally, to return to the left-right divide and the, the, uh, the, the, the, the, the impact of uh, politics. And the, the, the goal here is to change the trimer, not the Mercosi, the trichet Merkel, or the dramer, Draghi Merkel, to something which should be uh, dramolo, dramolo, Draghi, Monti, liberal vision, and Hollande, socialist vision. That will be a new alliance. I think that's the part of the debate we have now to move from Dramer to Dramono. That's difficult to pronounce. I don't think I will have a lot of success with that. So if I return to EMU, that's the, the main, will be the, the main uh, focus of my intervention. What we know from EMU and all the literature, when we have a monetary union, we have three solutions. Or we have more solidarity, or we have more flexibility, or we have more migration. And you can sophisticate that, but you return all, ta all the time, all the scholars will say more solidarity, more deregulation, more migration. And if you look to the definition of grow, of Draghi, because 
many say, okay, that's interesting. No, the central bank is in favor of grow. The definition of Draghi about grow is deregulation and migration, which is the two parts of EMU, uh, which he, he will uh, support. I will not speak uh, about solidarity, but solidarity, what was the, the, the way for solidarity? It was the way to have a constitution. Then you have a constitution, you create the demos, and then you create the solidarity. Normally, it, it goes in a different sense, but that was the, the basic idea. We have an EMU, to have an EMU, to have a solidarity, we need a, a constitution. The constitution will create the demos, which is necessary to have solidarity uh, at the end of, of the day. It's, that's exactly the same debate that we have with the Eurobond. Is the role of Eurobond will be kind of way of express the solidarity? Is the solidarity the end of the process or at the beginning of the process we repeat the same question that we had uh, 10 years uh, ago? So that was the basic uh, of uh, EMU. But what happened? And that's my fantastic slide here done by, Christ uh, by Christophe and me about the story. We try to make sense of the story. Uh, we wrote a, a lot about all the, the, the process of coordination. So to take the, uh, the macroeconomic coordination, the stability and growth pact, the, the broad economic guidelines, the Cardiff process, but all the social coordination, the education coordination, OMC, and also sustainable development. And to see how it has evolved the last uh, 20 years. So we have basically four periods. And the third period is the, just after the Maastricht Treaty, and that was the dominance of, of the Ministry of Finance. They imposed the, the, the, the new Stability and Growth Pact and the, the, the, the broad uh, economic uh, guidelines, policy guidelines. So that the idea at that time, if we read the literature, is that because of EMU, you will have this kind automatically the, the uh, reduction of welfare state at national level and flexibility in wage bargaining at national level. What happened during that time is exactly the contrary. You had social pacts at national level and you had the emergence at European level of the uh, employment strategy and later the Lisbon strategy. I do not say that was progressive policies or effective policies, but that was certainly not what the Ministry of Finance, the central bankers had expected from EMU. They had expected exactly the contrary, to have the regulation and had partly regulation. So we move to uh, the second period, which is rather interesting. The second period is the period, the great story of OMC, the 100th floor, if we were in China. And if you look, it's really fascinating. In 2001, you had a lot of new procedure. You had the OMC pension, you had the, the, the OMC for, uh, for uh, poverty and social exclusion, you have the, the education, and you have all, even the, the uh, Sustainable Devel the first sustainable development uh, strategy at, at European level. So during that period, you had a lot of initiative. You had a, a, no, a lot of uncoordinated uh, initiative at, uh, at European level, mainly driven by the social actors. That was also, and that's linked to, to uh, the, the key factor, uh, the, the period where the left was in majority in most of the member states. So that's, if you remember, there were perhaps maximum 10 years on the, the 50 of the, the European integration. So that's the period when the left, and you had blooming ideas, tests, failure, uh, a lot of bureaucratic work at national level, but that was, once again, completely different from what the central bankers, from Trichet, uh, and from the ECFIN guys uh, were thinking. And then we move to the next period, which is the beginning of the great unification. And then you had the idea to rationalize the process in two main processes, one with the economic and employment, and the other with the social. If you look to this kind of grouping, it seems normal because it was present as normal, but you, we could have a very different grouping, clustering. We could have employment with social security on one hand and all the economic 
coordination on the other end in a one cluster. So th that was the, the, the beginning of integration within the uh, economic cluster of employment. If you return to the debate at that time, and the academic debate and the debate within the commission, with the DG employment, they want to keep apart all the, the, the, the, the social policies because they don't want to be contaminated by the ideas of ECFIN and say, okay, that's the last asterisk place we resist. We can say we are in favor of social policy because social policy is good and not we are in favor of social policy because social policy is efficient, which is rather different in the discourse. So you had the two grouping uh, and change in the majority, Barroso, new commission, turn to the right uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, of the member state. And then you arrive, and that's a rather fascinating, to the greed, final unification, EU 2020. So all the process I present at the beginning now are within 10 guidelines. Six about macroeconomic policy, microeconomic policy, environment, the six first, and all the social side is on four guidelines. Not only social side, but also sustainable development. So you have <coughs> poverty guidelines, if I do remember well, nine, two on uh, flex security, more or less flex security uh, and uh, uh, employment, and the last one uh, uh, <coughs> about education. So all the process is the kind of big unification, but the big unification under the control of ECFIN. And that's the, the difference. And I don't say, because that's not the end, I think, of the story, that we had kind of plot from the beginning that central bankers were then just pushing their agenda and they, that's the end of the story. I think that, as you present, there is some resistance in, in, in the, the member state, in the, within the commission. We, have, we could have a different balance between left and right after Hollande, etc. But uh, certainly, uh, that's for the moment, the unification under the umbrella of uh, ECFIN. What was the problem? The problem, and I finish, uh, I think, with that. The problem is they tried to have kind of unified instrument, but they didn't know which one. Some were saying it's EU 2020. The others say, oh, no, no, it's the annual growth survey. Others are arguing, no, that's the, the, uh, uh, the, the new pact. Uh, Others are, say, are, are saying, no, that's the semester. So that's interesting because you had a lot, and I will not show you all the attempts. You, you have to, the, the same ideas, which should have been in one integrated document, but now we have the same ideas, domination by the, the uh, economic actors, in at least four or five different documents, so which shows see, also the discrepancy between them that don't know exactly what is the reference document. And nobody knows, even the member state, when they have to answer to the commission, they don't know to which document they answer. At least last year, we did a, an in-depth study. It was really interesting because all were responding for, to different documents and some of the documents disappeared uh, since. So, uh, <coughs> to finish uh, uh, on that. So, with that, I think my argument that we had people having clear ideas or to deal with social policy because the textbook said you have to do that. And if you take Trichet, even in a distinguished journal like the Journal of Common Market Studies, that's very clearly explained. So that's not something that you don't find trace of that. You had, uh, that. You had Germany, which had a lot of difficulty to move from I am the model to we should have a model for all. And we had the, the left-right divide which explain uh, the, the, the, the story and uh, the dynamic. What, why I am positive at the end of this long talk? I've, I'm positive because I think that's the end of the window of, of opportunity. I think that we will return to normal debate saying that if you are willing to have growth, if growth is the goal, you cannot have growth with wage dumping and uh, reducing the deficit. That's the basic of the, the student first years at the, the, the university in economy. So if you want to have growth, you have 
or to have more wage increase or to have uh, less strict rules for the, the public deficit in the short term. That will be a, a new debate. Secondly, that's very clear that you have with two different persons, Monty on the one hand and Hollande on the other hand, a completely different debate at a political level in the European Union. That's also the end of the window of opportunity. And finally, I think, and that will be for another tool that I hope that you will invite me with better weather, but uh, if possible here, uh, I think we have to return to the question of sustainability. That's green sustainability because we had the, the first two years, 2008-9, we had this kind of kind of green Keynesianism, which we, we, we had investment for the future and saying we, we should take a different uh, direction. I think we will not escape to that debate again. It's not because you have a majority of right-wing government that the problem of global sustainability of the development model is finished. It's vanished. That will return at the, uh, the agenda and then open a, a lot of different tools on environmental and social policy. Thank you. Sticking with the theme of the weather, thank you for inviting me somewhere where it seemingly rains more than in Manchester. So. Uh, Normally, like to escape to sunnier places, but anyway, it's great. It's great to be here. Um, our the title of our paper is has slightly changed. Um, that's um, Mary, I may say, being pedantic about uh, the order of words. But this paper is co-written with Mary Daly from Queen's University Belfast, and unfortunately, she's not able to be here today. So um, I will be presenting on behalf of both of us. Uh, over the last. Uh, two years we've been uh, focusing on uh, Europe 2020 and the particular uh, contribution that Europe 2020 has been making to uh, social policy in Europe. Um, I'm not going to pull any punches. I, I will admit that we have fallen into uh, the pessimistic school uh, in, in terms of social policy and, and its development in Europe 2020, albeit we, we started in a, in, in a much happier place. Basically, the, the focus of, of our paper is to, is to take a, a slightly narrower um, uh, analysis of, of social policy in Europe 2020 by specifically focusing on um, the poverty and social exclusion target to remove 20 million individuals out of poverty by 2020. The intent here is to critically review the significance of this development via uh, a political sociology approach uh, to analyse developments within the governance architecture that is Europe 2020. What we're interested in here is to probe the interaction between ideas or, or policy concepts politics and governance mechanisms, and we develop a framework in which to, to analyze or identify conditions of governability uh, within the policy area and, and therefore apply it to, to the poverty target. Our main argument is that the weaknesses in the construction of the target result in it being ungovernable, and the particularities of the governance architecture also mean that it's ungoverned. Um, so, how, so, coming to, um, in terms of uh, theoretically where we're, where we're coming from here, um, first of all, we're, we're taking a very EU level focus here. We're not looking at developments within um, the member states uh, per se and, and how that's actually implemented. But we, we're coming from more uh, the Boras and Radayali perspective of viewing uh, strategies such as Lisbon and Europe 2020 as governance architectures, which they define as strategic and long-term political initiatives of international organisations on cross-cutting policy issues locked into commitments about targets and processes. Now, in terms of focusing on the particular um, EU level, uh, according to Boras and Radayali, they are comprised of an idea, you know, in analysing governance architectures, they are comprised of ideational and organisational components. The ideational component is defined as a set of fundamental 
um, ideational repertoires expressed in notions such as governance, competitiveness, sustainability, knowledge-based society, the market, and this is complemented by a discourse that uses the ideational, these ideational repertoires to discipline, organize, and legitimize the hierarchical relationships between the goals and the policy instruments. Taken together, ideas and discourses give shape to the overall attempt to socialize actors in a specific frame of reference. The organizational component of a governance architecture is much more concerned with the formal and informal organizational arrangements, where the ideational repertoires and discourses are defined and patterned through complex processes of a multi-level nature and the selection of policy instruments and their procedural requirements. Now, according to Boras and Radeoli, uh, analyzing different components of governance architectures in combination with Kingdom's multiple streams framework uh, enables the, research, uh, the researcher to understand how governance architectures emerge, how they're maintained, and how they're adapted over time. And on a second level within that framework, you can also look at um, the impact or compliance of member states with, those with a governance architecture through the Europeanisation lens. Now, both Mary and I agree with um, Boras and Radiali in fundamental respects. Um, however, we, we slightly disagree, and I, I, I say the word slightly because I can see Claudio in, in, in the back of the room. Um, <laughs> but we, we, what our particular issue here was that we, we wanted to take that concept and focus on a particular policy area. Uh, in, in the paper itself, uh, Boras and Radiali's paper, um, we believe that there's a thrust towards a stasis, implying that a policy area is to be conceived uh, as being structured by the prevailing ideational and organisational components at any one moment in time. So in actual fact, um, the paper is essentially institutionalist and is interested in the kind of big moments of those governance architectures. Um, we're, we, all, we also have reservations with respect to the role and place of politics. And although politics is integrated into the framework, we, we, we tend to believe that the structure that's biased um, in, in the view of government's instruments is, is done so in a politically neutral way. So have, having said that, we, we fundamentally um, support the, the, the governance architecture approach. We're just coming from, coming from a more political sociology perspective where we're focusing on actors and the fluidity um, of those actors. So um, we essentially suggest um, the utility of bringing in this polit political sociology approach. And an underlying point here is that ideas, discourses, governance instruments and arrangements are inherently political. The subject of ongoing power struggles between actors that are continually being remade rather than fixed. And instead of being neutral, instruments and governance arrangements confront actors with structures of opportunity and privilege. Uh, certain courses of actions, interests, and actors over others. From this perspective, all elements of governance, archite of an governance architecture are to be conceived as located in a hierarchy of power and privilege. And this brings us to uh, the following insights in terms of analyzing a, a policy area. Uh, elements of governance architectures always involve a set of meanings that cannot be disconnected from the wider social and political context. Governance architectures involve a set of political relations that shape the choice and implementation of policy instruments, ideas and discourses. And policy domains and their governance architecture um, and their governance are inherently political in nature and reflect and generate hierarchies of power and authority. Now, these particular insights in this perspective lead us to consider the conditions whereby a policy program can be taken forward in an EU context. And the conditions that we develop focus on the coherence of the instrument in an um, ideational sense, where the policy instrument fits politically in the process of the governance architecture, and the nature and strength of the government governance arrangements in place. So we are analysing the, the poverty target in the context of those three conditions. 
So first of all, coming to the, the first condition, how meaningful is the poverty target? Well, the target itself is um, a, a target that has comprised of three different definitions of poverty. Relative poverty, material deprivation, and jobless household. Um, we see, for example, the First, these are very, very different definitions of poverty. They have very different philosophical underpinnings and call for very different actions in terms of policy responses. They fit very differently in member state social policy traditions and politics and as empirical phenomenon um, very widely in the nature and extent. Now, you know, in, in terms of governance architectures and, and their policy areas, a degree of flexibility and a degree of differentiation um, is, is, some would argue, necessary uh, in order to gain broad support, particularly considering the, the contested formation of, of the poverty target. But the, the real problem here is that um, Relative poverty and the jobless household definition are two very ideologically opposed uh, conceptions of poverty. The relationship between um, a jobless household and poverty has never fully been established. Um, for example, 40% of middle class households live in jobless um, 40% of middle class individuals across the EU can be considered as living in a jobless household. So there are significant problems here. And of course there is also the sense, as some of us who are more familiar with the liberal model will realise that you know, having a job doesn't necessarily mean that you don't live in poverty. So, um, in, in this respect, um, we see it as a kind of ideological mixed bag um, that is incredibly difficult to, to interpret. It builds on some of the traditions that have been established within the member states, but in doing so, potentially undermines its, its particular success. Where does the, the target sit in relation to other policy objectives and the policy hierarchy? This is um, focusing more on exact, you know, focusing more on the idea that within governance architectures such as Europe 2020, there is no such thing as 10 guidelines, 10 integrated guidelines that all have an equal weight and are considered equally important. That's just not the case. The poverty target is situated very low in terms of Europe 2020's priorities. We argue that its achievement is derivative of progress in other policy areas. Europe 2020 privileges activity and progress within the macroeconomic pillar over other pillars. It empowers actors within DG economic and financial affairs as well as those operating in financial ministries at the national level. At the heart of Europe 2020 are two aims. First, to modernise and increase competitiveness, uh, but second, to reduce member state budget deficits and total levels of debt. Member states are to abide by the concept of fiscal sustainability in their monetary policies and developments within the economic and employment pillars, which actually includes the poverty target, are to demonstrate an appreciation of this principle. In other words, developments in the thematic components of Europe 2020 are rendered a function of the progress in the macro economy. The EU's response to the Eurozone crisis exacerbates these tendencies and reinforces this hierarchy of priorities within 2020. So reforms to the EU's broader economic governance are reinforcing macroeconomic discipline. As the Eurozone crisis has continued to gather momentum, um, we have seen that 14 of the EU's 27 member states currently have government debt levels above the 60% of total GDP threshold. With the possibility of a fine, there are strong incentives for such member states to reduce their government debt via spending reductions, leaving very few resources left to address the poverty target. And for final third condition, um, relates to the actual modes of governance. How is the poverty target governed? Well, the incorporation of poverty and social exclusion into the employment pillar suggests the strengthening of its governance. Since employment has historically generally been considered to be the most advanced and developed sphere of the OMC, 
The employment pillar features an annual governance cycle, commonly agreed guidelines, uh, the reporting of progress in national reform programmes, peer review and the issuing of country specific recommendations. However, the shift uh, in, governance, in the governance of poverty and social exclusion doesn't necessarily signify an improvement to its mode of governance. Um, the first point to note is that its full incorporation into the employment pillar creates legal uncertainties surrounding its governance. The issue of country-specific recommendations is still a contentious issue for the area of poverty and so, uh, for the poverty target. And three countries in particular are vehemently opposed uh, for its use. Um, our very own UK, uh, Denmark and Poland have been three of the most vocal critics of country-specific recommendations uh, for uh, guideline number 10. The second issue concerns the high degree of uncertainty surrounding the governance of the poverty target, particularly with respect to who governs. Following the launch of Europe 2020, the OMC social exclusion uh, was basically suspended. This left a high degree of uncertainty as to who was responsible uh, and in terms of encouraging progress towards the poverty target. The reintroduction of some elements of the OMC has not particularly clarified this situation. The agreement that member states must now produce national social reports in addition to the national reform programmes has led to confusion, even if some reports are to be synchronised with the European semester and the national reform programmes. It's difficult to see this as a major development which improves the clarity as to who is responsible for the poverty target. The third and final point is that ambigu uh, ambiguities surrounding the governance of poverty and social exclusion have been further heightened by un uncertainties surrounding the purpose and function of the European platform against poverty and social exclusion. The aim of the platform is to create a commitment among the member states, EU institutions and key stakeholders to fight poverty and social exclusion. Uh, it intends to identify best practice, promote mutual learning, establish EU-wide rules and make the necessary EU funds available. However, its purpose is unclear, particularly with respect to its supposed difference between the platform and the recently relaunched OMC social exclusion. The Polish presidency in, I think, October 2011 launched the first um, platform against poverty, of which only 11 member states sent official delegations. That's 11 member states out of, out of 27. Um, overall, then, the governance of poverty and social exclusion is very much based on a voluntary agreement. There's a high degree of uncertainty and there's a high degree of ambiguity. Finally, to conclude, um, the EU target then is, is only as good as the targets that are uploaded uh, at, at the EU level, so the targets that are set within the member states and then subsequently uploaded. Um, there's always been two main risks here. Uh, that member states will choose a focus that is not consonant with the EU's way of conceiving poverty, or that they will choose a target that is too low and thereby makes an insufficient contribution to the overall target to reduce poverty by 20 million. It's, it's something of a double jeopardy. Regarding the actual definitions chosen, the latest information, information suggests that the first jeopardy has come to pass. Seven member states have chosen their own definition of poverty. Luxembourg has decided not to set a target at all. And in total, from what we can calculate, there are currently 11 or so different definitions of poverty across the EU member states in terms of using the target. In terms of the actual target set, we can also say that the second jeopardy has occurred, that estimates available to date point to a great shortfall of 20 million. The EU target is short by between five and eight million. Um, if I'd lost three million pounds, I would be concerned where that had gone, but the, the lost millions here are actually a causality of the impossibility of ensuring that member state targets and priorities co um, culminate appropriately to those at the EU level. So the, the different definitions that are used um, actually hinder um, uh, clarity in, in, in terms of whether the 20 million can, can actually be achieved. So. Um, 
I wish I had more good news. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to be so uh, pessimistic. It's very unlike myself, I'd just like to say. But um, the framework that, in conclusion, that we've constructed, we, we've been building or trying to work with um, Boras and Radioli's concept of governance architecture, but particularly to come from a, a political sociology approach. Um, we're much, we've been interested in ideas, agency, um, politics and governance mechanisms as interrelated. Um, for us, governance architectures are not value-free arenas, but they're sites of political struggle between various social actors, uh, which construct hierarchies of priorities and power and thereby serve to determine, <coughs> excuse me, whether a policy program can be taken forward or not in an EU context. They're not static entities or institutions, governance architectures. Um, they're dynamic and continuously being remade. And, and that was our particular aim here. We wanted to focus on analyzing a policy area while taking into consideration the broader hierarchy that is um, uh, the Lisbon strategy, Europe 2020, uh, whatever. Um, applying the framework leads us to believe that, or uh, leads us to the argument that the poverty target is ungovernable and ungoverned. And it also leads us to the conclusion that Europe 2020 does not signify progress for EU social policy. Um, Europe 2020 rests uh, on the expectation that a joined up governance process, uh, i.e. the European semester, will lead to an upgrading of social policy and increase the chances of poverty and social exclusion being part of an integrated approach. Um, while it's novel in an EU context to have uh, a target for poverty and social exclusion, and the target, of course, does have some innovative and ambitious elements, um, it does not signify a strengthening of the social dimension. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>